Last Christmas, one of my one of my close friends died from cancer. I still think about that from time to time because you know when I first moved to America about ten years ago, Samantha and a group of friends, you know, they were the the youth group that I was a part of, and this youth group they really just like embraced me. You know, there's this kid who just came from Oman, has this accent, foreign kid, he doesn't know where to go, but these guys they just like embraced me. They're like, yo, let's just go, let's just go here, let's go have fun. And Samantha was a part of this group. You know, she was originally from Maryland but she had been living in San Diego so after her passing her friends flew to San Diego from from Maryland and they crashed with us uh, Elena and myself and so when they came you know I quickly took on the role of of just fixing things I, I gave them rides I went here I, I went there till Sierra <laughs> one of our friends she just stopped me on my tracks and she's like she said this Kevin we just lost our friend and I would like you right now to stop fixing things. We'll have time for that. But right now, I just want you to grieve with us. To be honest with you, uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that even now. But at that time, you know, grieving, at least for Sierra and for the group, meant just pausing and sitting in solidarity with our friends, letting Sam's memories just wash over us. And so I think, I think in some ways, that's what Jesus is doing in this story in John chapter 11. Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? Like, especially when he knew that he could, just in a few moments, he could raise Lazarus. As a matter of fact, spoiler alert, for those of you who don't know this story, Jesus does raise Lazarus from the dead. So why does he, why does he cry? Well, the text says that he was deeply moved. He was deeply moved when he saw those who were mourning. Jesus also cried because he was thinking about how hurtful and how deep sin is. To the, and how it's hurting the human race. And he's thinking about all these things and he's overwhelmed with emotion and he's, and he's grieving. The omniscient God, the God who knows all things, the creator of all things, the word made flesh, the one who knows the future, the one who knows the things that are about to take place, he is now crying, he's weeping. Jesus, God, is grieving. The first point that, that I hear and I understand from this story is this. Grief deepens hope. When we allow ourselves to feel grief, when we allow ourselves to feel sorrow and sadness, this actually creates room, it creates space for hope, especially within uh, the Christian faith tradition. Without grief, hope in many ways can feel shallow. And that's probably why, at least in my experience, it seems that the people who have gone through much pain, that the people who have endured much suffering in their lives are simultaneously people who have, who have these deep subterranean capacities for hope. In the book, uh, Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis, he has just lost his wife and he writes a series of reflections on grief and on God and on suffering. And there's this excerpt from this book and I want, to, I want you to read this. He says, talk to me about the truth of religion and I will listen gladly. Talk to me about the duty of religion and I will listen submissively. But don't come talking to me about the consolations or the comforts of religion or I shall suspect that you don't understand. C.S. Lewis, at the time of this writing, he's a Christian. You know, he's a believer in God. He, he believes in religion. So he says this towards those who use religion, who you use, those who use theology to prematurely offer advice to people when what they really need is for someone to just sit with them in the silence. Because, you, because grief is not just a state of mind, but it's a process of being. Those of us who have mourned the loss of someone in our lives know that, knows that it just changes everything about you completely. It affects how we understand one another. It affects how we understand the future. It affects how we understand God. It affects how we understand ourselves. And it's not something that we can just pray one day and it will go away. He knew that Lazarus was going to be resurrected. Jesus knew that he himself was the life. Jesus knew the right beliefs. Jesus knew the right theologies. Jesus knew the Bible studies about the death and how it's asleep. Jesus knew all the right stuff to say. But at this point, he still allowed himself to feel the pain and the grief 
of a friend who's gone. Not only that, Jesus also weeps, like I mentioned before, because of the pain of other people. And a principle for us here today is that empathy for one another and stepping into the pain of somebody else, regardless of who they are and what they have done and what they have done before that moment, that instance, is this deep core practice of the way of Jesus, of stepping into somebody else's story. And empathy extends, I think, beyond post-mortem care. In an age of outrage, empathy could mean uh, resisting the urge to to lash out at somebody on Facebook or on a comment that they, on a post that they shared, but instead taking the time to maybe hit them up on a direct message or a phone call and asking them to clarify. Maybe empathy could mean honoring someone's story by, by listening to understand rather than to reply. Maybe grieving today can look like us taking the time every day, some moments to just pray for people by name. Because you see, the moment you think about somebody, you know what, God, I pray that you please be with so and so. You are literally just lift, you're taking their burdens and you're just lifting them up to the throne room of grace, which is a deep act of care. You're doing something really, really sacred. You're grieving with that person. And this leads to our second point. If grief grief deepens hope, then hope sweetens grief. And we know this from how the story ends in John chapter 11. To the open grave, Jesus shouts, Come forth, Lazarus! Lazarus uh, walks out alive. Hope reminds us that uh, that there's meaning behind the the meaningless, the messiness. Hope reminds us that there is purpose behind the pain. Hope reminds us that there is significance behind the suffering. Hope doesn't take away the grief, but it can it can sweeten it. You know, just like my chai, you know, when you just add a little bit of sugar to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't take away the bitterness, you know, it, but it just it sweetens it. Those who hold on to hope, they grieve differently. It's a different kind of experience that is marked by, yes, excruciating pain, but also a different texture or flavor of joy. And I want to let end this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King, who um, wrote this thing at, at the end of, uh, during a very tough, tough time in his life. At times, life is hard, as hard as crucible steel. It has its bleak and painful moments. Like the ever-flowing waters of a river, life has its moments of drought and its moments of flood. Like the ever-changing cycle of the seasons, life has the soothing warmth of the summers and the piercing chills of its winters. But through it all, God walks with us. Never forget that God is able to lift you from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope and transform dark and desolate valleys into sunlit paths of inner peace.